All right, thank you, Pastor Jeff. Hey, um, this is the good news tonight. Those of you that are here, you're the ones that are really saved. You have real faith. <laughs> Pastor Jeff, did you hear what I said? I said, these are the ones that are, the good news is the ones that are here are the ones that are really saved. <laughs> I hope, I know that people didn't misunderstand that. But when you have true faith, man, the faith that saves, it always has some result in it, and it's because you've been revolutionized, and really it's not about going to church. You feed yourself every day. In fact, sometimes the thing that makes you mess up and not really be a true Christian is you only go to church every time the doors are open and nothing else happens. But that's that daily walk, get that word open and worship and pray, you know, and, and ask God to help us. And, uh, and it's by the Spirit and the Word that, uh, that He brings us to life. If we're a little bit complacent and dead, then He can bring us to life. Well, uh, thank God the election is over. And uh, I, uh, I, uh, I, I believe that the proper uh, response for everybody is to love and respect every person I was, uh, I felt uh, encouraged when I heard our current president be gracious in his speech and when I heard uh, uh, Mrs. Clinton also be gracious in her uh, speech and, uh, and also uh, our president-elect Trump also be gracious in his speech uh, and, and that, uh, that there seemed to be the hope that I would have as a, a nation that we would come together. And uh, a lot of people seem to be pretty charged up about this election, as if it's going to make a difference. I went to bed the night before the election and then went to bed the night after the election, and America was just as sinful as it had been before the election. And the problem in America is not politicians, it's sin. In Revelation 3, John the Revelator writes the first three verses. To the angel of the church in Sardis, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Wake up. I believe this is a message to America, the church of America. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. The average age of great civilizations in history has been approximately 200 years. You've heard this before. And that being true, that means that America is living on borrowed time. And America is a sick nation, folks. It's a sick nation with some people that are truly healthy. But across the board, churches are filled with people that are religious, as, as, Paul, uh, uh, as Paul wrote to Timothy, in, in that in the last days that people have a form of religion but not having the power of God. They'll have a belief system, in other words. They will still talk about God, as Pastor Jeff preached about this morning, have a faith about God, but be dead. We're a sick nation. Since 1960, there's been a 560% increase in violent crime, more than 400% increase in illegitimate births, a quadrupling in divorces, not to mention the abortions after abortion after abortion that happens, and more and more people are buying in that that's okay somehow. Uh, a, 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 a tripling of the percentage of children living in single parent homes, not that single parent children can't be great and single parents can't do a great job, but the brokenness is what I'm talking about. More than 200% increase in teenage suicide rate, a drop of 75 points in the average SAT scores from high school students across our nation. Today, 30% of all births are illegitimate. Even though the United States only has 6% of the world's population, we have 80% of all divorces. We lead the industrialized world in murder, rape, and violent crime, and 80% of all the whiskey consumed in the world is consumed in America. We have become a nation where the criminal is deified, the victim is vilified, and where evil is called good, and good is called evil. We have become a nation where the life of an the, the, of a, of a, of a animal is elevated and has more value than the baby in the womb. Character doesn't matter, only our self-gratification. That's the mark 
as a rule of America. We are a nation that is marked by moral regression, sexual revolution, spiritual rebellion, and America uh, may not ever be conquered from the outside, but there is a conquering happening right now from inside America. It's coming from within. Just like every other civilization that ever fell, sports becomes more important than God. Let me tell you something. We're going to have some bad things happen in the next 50 years. My grandbaby born Friday night and my little grandson that will be 2 December 23rd, my goal is to not make them great in athletics, but great in God. Great in the Word. To send steel, steel rods deep within the surface because adversities of winds are going to blow in this world. Things are going to heat up because we live in the last days, and I'll talk more about that later. But I'm going to tell you what, we need to quit focusing on the things that are momentary, the things that point glory to us. We need to get our children ready to take a stand, be strong, because let me tell you, if you think the Holocaust was bad, the Bible says that things that are going to get there in the last days, things are going to be worse than they've ever been. And I'm going to tell you, things are happening now, and that does not mean you're going to escape a lot of tribulation and trouble. You say, well, it's not going to happen because I'm going to get out of here. No, you don't know that. We've already seen horrifying things throughout the history of our world that you guarantee you anyone looking at the Bible thought, I'm going to escape that, but they didn't. And even today, Christians are being put to death, shot in the head, kids shot right in front of their parents. There is horrible things happening, persecution around this world, and we live in an uncertain time. And America, America is not a land that has the ability in itself to protect itself. Only God can protect you and only God can help you stay strong and be able to endure whatever might come down the pike. And if you love your grandchildren, if you love your children, the number one thing you need to do is spend time helping them memorize the word, read the word, teach them how to pray, grow them mighty in spirit, not church attenders. The problem with America is so many kids raised in the church that don't really follow Jesus and they're, and they're, they're I wouldn't even say lukewarm. They just have a belief system. They think they're going to heaven. But they're not saved. They've never been saved because they've never repented. Because the Holy Spirit has not ever touched their hearts because there's something wrong within them. And I, I don't understand why, but I'm telling you, I'm concerned. And, and, and you should be concerned because we live in a sinful society. And the Bible talks about a, the curse it is to raise kids in a sinful culture. It talks about it. And, and, and Jesus actually talks about it himself. And so... Uh, we may not get destroyed by any bells, but I believe we're headed towards self-destruction. America's biggest problem is not inflation. Listen to me. It's not interest rates. It's not the budget. It's not deficits. It's not politicians. It's not even crime. The biggest problem in America is sin. The sinfulness of those that don't know God and the sinfulness of those who believe about God and, yes, the sinfulness of those who are a part of the church who Bible says we need to turn and repent first of our own sin and call on God to heal our lands. Billy Graham recently had a birthday, but three years ago he delivered his last message to America. And most of my message is this video. I let Tammy read it. I mean, watch it, and she could hardly watch it. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you're watching online, I hope they will allow us because this is on YouTube. And I hope they'll allow us to live stream this because this is public material. It is not protected. There's nothing in it that should not be able to be live streamed. In this video, you'll see Billy Graham sitting in his chair at his birthday. He's an old man, and he's talking. It's powerful. He talks about the cross. And then you'll see Billy, uh, they'll switch over to Billy preaching in some of his greatest moments in his crusades. And then they'll switch over to two individuals giving their testimony about the power of Jesus to change lives. And at the end of this message, if you don't understand that what every human being, no matter who they think they are, how rich they are, I don't care what color of their skin, I don't care how young they are, how old they are, how church they are, the only answer to America is the cross of Jesus Christ in its fullest meaning. Roll this video and I'll conclude at the end. For 60 years, my father, Billy Graham, preached the gospel of Jesus Christ 
And at 95, he has a message that he'd like to share with you right here from his home. And it's a message I believe that can change your life and change the direction of this nation. Young Billy Graham hailed another Billy Sunday. Reverend Billy Graham, one of the most inspirational spiritual leaders of the 20th century. We need you, we love you. Thank you for coming, Billy Graham. Would you welcome please evangelist, author, educator, Dr. Billy Graham. Our recipient, the man who honors us by being here today. What is your purpose? Go into the whole world and proclaim this you message. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Shall make you free. As I look back over my life, it's full of surprises. I never thought I would become friends with people in different countries all over the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I want us to look at the cross tonight. I see how God's hand guided me. When I began preaching many years ago, it is not with any thoughts that I'd be preaching to large audiences. Come to the cross! His gospel is for everyone! God has done this. Christ is alive! In modern America today, there is a vacuum of the soul. Our country is in great need of a spiritual awakening. Well, there have been times that I've wept as I've gone from city to city and I've seen how far people have wandered from God. Of all the things that I've seen and heard, there's only one message that can change people's lives and hearts. There is a way if you come by the way of the cross. The cross, the cross. I want to tell people about the meaning of the cross. Not the cross that hangs on a wall or around someone's neck. We receive our freedom purchased by the ransom at the cross but the real cross of Christ. The cross expresses the great love of God for man. It's scarred and blood-stained. His was a rugged cross. His real purpose for coming was to die. I know that many will react to this message, but it is the truth. And with all my heart, I want to leave you with the truth. God says, I love you. I love you. I love you with an everlasting love. That he loves you willing to forgive you of all your sins. On our churches, we have a cross. It's embossed on our Bibles. On our Bibles. I thought the cross was a relic. It was a medallion on a necklace at best. It's an ornament that we wear around our necks, Christians and non-Christians. The cross really didn't have any meaning to me except for something artistic that rock stars wore. But talk about the depth and the real meaning of the cross, and it becomes an offense. Why is that? The cross is offensive because it confronts people. Even so, it's a confrontation that all of us must face. I was really hurting and just didn't understand the source of all my pain and, 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 and problems. I spent my whole life just burdened for something. Hungering for something, thirsting after, chasing this thing that I couldn't put my finger on, ultimately. I was abused by older people, some in the family, some outside of the family. So as I got older, I always talked back, I always got into fights. My whole world was surrounded by guns and drugs and gangs. I remember in front of all my friends, just tell them to watch this, and as a lady, uh, was driving down the street. I jumped in the middle of the street and pointed the gun right at her. Just to see her panic and freak out. And it was just me seeking power. My mom always told me about God. 
I think I had an idea that God was big and good, but as time went on and I saw more and more tragic things happen around me, I think that was the beginning of me just questioning everything about life and about God. When I was 10 years old, my stepdad came to pick me up and he said that my cousin Kelly was dead. I remember being so mad and really just just deciding that if God was big and good, why wouldn't he protect my cousin who is so tiny and so awesome, such a funny, brilliant little guy. Why wouldn't God protect him from a huge muscle guy like his stepdad who beat him to death? I look out across an audience when I stand up to preach, and I think of all the people with their different backgrounds and their various needs. And I know that they are objects of God's mighty love. To the point that he gave his son, his only son, to die upon a cross. And the cross was the most terrible form of execution by the Romans for criminals. And Jesus endured all that in our place because of our sins. We deserve the cross. We deserve hell. We deserve judgment and all that that means. I know that there are many people that dispute that. People don't want to hear that they're sinners. To many people, it's an offense. The cross is offensive because it directly confronts the evils which dominate so much of this world. You see, the Bible teaches that all of us are wrong. We've all gone astray. We've everyone turned to his own way. And when we turn to our own way, we go astray from God's way. And that includes the whole human race. And that's why the world is in such terrible danger right now. It's not dangerous so much because we have atomic bombs. It's dangerous because of the human hearts back of the bombs, filled with envy and hate and strife and greed and lust and all the other things that could pull the trigger. thinking that same year that my cousin died about the depth of the evil in the world. I never wanted to have kids. It was just a new person to suffer. That was the year I started to cry myself to sleep every night and stopped believing in God. I couldn't get away from my own depression. So I started studying other religions. There was a lot of nice ideas, but there wasn't any tangible healing. And I remember thinking, I'm tired of the pain in my heart. I'm tired of going to bed that way. I'm tired of feeling like a burden. I'm just tired of not knowing why I'm alive. And so I remember the night I laid in bed and I knew I was going to commit suicide the next day. I knew that I was not going to live past tomorrow. By 16, I was getting high on a daily basis and got involved with a woman after woman after woman. And you know, when you mix drugs, you mix alcohol, you mix youth, it's cause for an explosion. My mother was really concerned about me. I remember she just grabbed a Bible and said, I don't know what to do, but you just need to read this Bible. You know, I remember taking the pages of the Bible and just ripping them out and throwing them on the ground and saying, I don't care about your God. I don't care about this. This isn't mean anything to me.
One reason that the cross is a defense to people is because it demands, it doesn't suggest, it demands a new lifestyle in all of us. Sin is a disease in the human heart. It affects the mind and the will and the emotions. Every part of our being is affected by this disease. How can we break this bondage? How can we be set free? God helps us break those chains. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things pass away. Everything becomes new. He can make you a totally new person. On the day that I planned to commit suicide, I came home from school and my grandma was there and she wasn't supposed to be there. And she looked at me and said, there's something wrong with you. You're gonna go to church. I was like, no way I'm going to church. And she screamed at the top of her lungs like we were fighting back and forth and I just didn't want to listen to her yell anymore. And so I decided, fine, I'll go. And then afterwards, I'll go ahead and follow through with my plan. So I went to the back of the church and slumped down in my chair and hated everybody in the room. And the pastor started speaking and I hated him more than anyone. And he says, there's a suicidal spirit in the room. And of course, all the hair stood up on the back of my neck and I was, well, this is really weird. <laughs> and I got up and went to the door. A white-headed man was standing there and he stopped me. And it was like, the Lord wants me to speak to you. He wants you to know that even though you've never known an earthly father, that God will be a better father to you than any earthly father could ever be. God knows the pain in your heart. He's seen you cry yourself to sleep at night. The idea was so overwhelming to me. He's like, do you want me to pray for you so that Jesus can take the pain out of your heart? He put his hand on my shoulder and started to pray. It was as if the God of the universe showed up right in front of me. And the first thing I noticed was that God was holy and good. And the second thing I noticed was that I was so not holy and not good. I was in a really dark place. I was really lonely, really depressed. And a friend of mine reached out and invited me to a conference. And I'm thinking, why not? My mind was blown when I got there. I had never seen anything like it. I saw guys with, with bullet wounds and ex-gang members who loved Jesus, and I had never seen anything like that before. And so uh, I was intrigued. I'll never forget the pastor. You know, he started talking about Jesus and in talking about him in an intense way that I had never thought about before. I had never just imagined Jesus as a real person going through real things. I just kind of thought of him as this fairy, off distant person. But he brought it home to me and he started talking about Jesus um, being beaten and being whipped for a crime he didn't commit and the skin being ripped off his back and him having to in the midst of his pain, carry this cross up this mountain of a skull and being pinned to this cross. It was so vivid and visual to me. I could, I, it was like I could see this happening to Jesus. And I remember him saying like, how dare you tough guys call my Jesus a punk? You know, like, look at what he went through. And then the preacher said, do you not know you've been bought with the price? And it just came to a head. It was like, wow. 
on that cross, God was laying on Jesus our sins. They not only put nails in his hands, but before that, they scourged him. A Roman scourge was a terrible thing. They took whips and pellets on those whips and beat a person almost to death. And then they took that cross and made him carry the cross, which was in his weakened condition was almost impossible. But he carried that cross to a place outside of Jerusalem. And then they put nails in his hands. But that was not the real suffering. The real suffering is when he said, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In that terrible moment, he and God, the Father, were separated. He shed his blood, and the shedding of that blood carries with it God's very life. The blood is the meeting place between God and man. And the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. And that's what Christ was doing on the cross. He was making atonement for our sins, and he was shedding his blood. Now, when you take the blood out, that means you're giving your life. And that's what it means. It means the life of Christ. The cross and the resurrection of Christ offers forgiveness of sin, offers a whole new life, and offers you eternal life if you come to the cross by repentance and faith. Jesus literally took all of this on his own back for me. You know, I remember bowing out, just head touching the ground and saying, I'm sorry, God, I'm sorry. But one step led to another, which led to another. And, you know, I was back drinking and sleeping around with women. And the conviction that I was now feeling was so strong. And I remember driving on the highway, just thinking to myself, God, you gotta do something. Because if you don't do something, I might hurt myself or hurt somebody else. I don't know what's gonna happen, but just don't kill me. I get cut off by a truck and my truck just starts tipping until it flips over and starts rolling fast. The glass is coming in, the windshield cracks. I'm not wearing a seatbelt at all, so I'm kind of floating around the car. And I looked myself over. There was just a piece of glass stuck in my arm and I pulled it out, and that was it. I said, Lord, I need to get with you. I need you to change me. I need you to really make this real, and I need to stop running from you. I was genuinely trying to know him more and read my Bible and grow, and I really began to be a passionate, Christ follower. But you set me free. Oh. I gave you no reason to give me new seasons, to give me new life, new breathing. No. But you hung there bleeding. You died for my lies and my cheating, my lust and my greed. Lord. What is a man? I realized you don't earn righteousness, that none of us is righteous, not even one, and that our works are like filthy rags to God. Jesus lived the life I could not live and died the death I should have died. You know, that, that gets me every time just to think, man, I gain everything by putting my trust in him. If God had looked at me and said, go away forever, he would have been right. It would have been just as. The same time I felt that, I felt him inviting me to an embrace of grace and love unconditional. It was like 
God is saying, I love you. I know you're tired of the way you've been living and I will make you new if you will let me. My heart was just yes, it just said yes, I, I need that, I want that, please. And that's why I woke up the next day. I just felt such a peace and a joy almost that I'd never felt before. Jesus saved my life, and on top of everything else, the life of my son and the new baby. That wouldn't be if Jesus hadn't intervened and rescued me. And the most overwhelming thing is to think that Jesus became sin, and it was my sin. And it was things that I've done. The house I'm on the cross, it was things that I've done. He hung naked on a cross, bleeding in a shameful way, so that I would never have to be ashamed for the things that I've done. The truth is, the truth is, there is no other way besides Christ and what he did. There is no life outside of that. There is no other way of salvation except through the cross of Christ. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. The only way to the Father, Father God, is through his son, Jesus Christ. Now why Jesus? He's the only one that was born into this world without sin. But more than that, he was a righteous one. And when you come to him, you're clothed in his righteousness. God no longer sees your sin. He no longer sees your own heart. He sees Jesus. Now, I don't understand all about it. There are many things about the cross and about salvation that I do not understand. And I'm not told that I have to understand it all. I'm told that I'm to believe. And anybody can believe. A blind man can believe. A deaf man can believe. An old person can believe. A young person can believe. And that word believe means commit. I commit my life totally to Him. Jesus Christ from the cross says, I will save you, I will forgive you, I will change you, I'll make you a new person if you come to the cross by repentance and faith. Come to Christ. When you come to Christ, you come by the way of repentance. Repent means to change, to change your way of living and turn from your sins and turn to Jesus Christ and say, I'm a sinner. I need forgiveness. And I know that you're the only one that can change me. Home went dark that violent day. The whole earth quaked at love's display. Three days silent in the ground This body born for heaven's crown
The Bible says in spite of our rebellion and rejection, God loves you. He loves you so much that he gave his son to die for your sins. And when Christ died on that cross, he became guilty of lying. He became guilty of slander. He became guilty of jealousy. He became guilty of the most filthy, dirty sins. Christ took the hell that you and I deserve. Now God says, receive him, believe in him, put your trust and your confidence in him, and I will forgive your sins, and I will guarantee you eternity in heaven. It's all yours, and it's all free. All you have to do is receive it. Today, I'm asking you to put your trust in Christ. I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer sentence by sentence after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you've died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins. I repent of my sins. I invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. He's alive. I've given my life not to a dead Christ, but to a living Christ. And he's given me a song to sing. He's given me a flag to follow. I have reason for existence. I know where I've come from. I know why I'm here. I know where I'm going. Do you? If you just prayed that prayer with my father, I'd like for you to go to our website. We have some resources there that we would like for you to have. These are resources that will help you to grow in your new relationship with Almighty God and His Son, Jesus Christ. Remember this one thing, that God loves you. And the Bible tells us that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. God bless you, and thank you for watching. you hear it tonight, you'd bow your head with me as a church, close your eyes, and you break that your prayer, and you meant it with all your heart tonight. Did you lift your hand and say, I called upon Jesus tonight to be my savior, to forgive my sins. Would you lift your hand? Anybody here? I want to conclude this message about America by saying, if we were as passionate to leave the last message for America as Billy Graham, that people would come to know Jesus, America would be healed. If we were as passionate about sports, about Jesus as we are about sports, if we were as passionate about Jesus and this gospel and the cross of Jesus as we are about pleasure, as we are about outdoor things and travel, and having our American lifestyle and protecting our uh, uh, way of living and our comforts. If we were as passionate about seeing people come to Jesus, then America would begin to turn. But the truth is, the church has gotten to where it, 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 it's believing everything else to change America. People listen to me. No political candidate and no political party is gonna change our country. Our country is infiltrated by sin. And certain things might get better in your opinion one way or another depending on policy. But you can't uh, legislate the heart of man. 
You cannot make law to change a man's heart. The Old Testament law could not change a man's heart. Only Jesus changes a man's heart. Now I want you to know that I believe we're in the last days. The Bible in Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, throughout scriptures lists signs of the end time. Wars, rumors of wars, uprisings and revolutions and earthquakes, natural disasters, uh, lawlessness, false prophets, false teachers, false messiahs, the rise of evil in our cultures previously unimaginable, the persecution of believers, betrayal and apostasy, just to name a few. You can go through and in every way the Bible talks about these being the end of times and you can see it. And yet somehow we hold on to America as our first allegiance. Jesus is our first allegiance. We are Christians first and Americans second. We are followers of Jesus and he is our father first. And he said, don't love me more than your mother or your father, your brother or sister or your husband or your wife or even your children. In other words, you love all them. He said, you, you know what it's like to love all of them. But your love to me has to be superior and first and foremost. But America has put their families as an idol in front of God. This is the problem. For all of us, we must face it. Jesus said we'll experience birth pains, and we're experiencing these today. When in history have we not had wars and revolutions and earthquakes and apostasy? What makes this day that we're living in and what I'm saying different from all the others? I remember as a child in the 60s, they were still talking about 1947 when Israel became a nation. And I remember what a big deal it was in 67 when Israel won the war and, and gained their independence in that. Let me tell you, if you're talking about preaching about Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, can you imagine with it being so current? But now many years has come and, many, and, 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 and since that day. But let me tell you something, the answer why biblical prophecy is crystal clear in these, that this is the last days we're living in is the, the markings of Israel. The world witnessed this miraculous prophetic rebirth of the state of Israel and I'm telling you, it was a while ago, but it was big. Jesus coming back to the Holy Land, uh, 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 Jews rather coming back to the Holy Land after centuries of exile, Jews rebuilding ancient ruins, Israel becoming the epicenter of international attention and growing international hostility and isolation all fits within these prophecies and we've seen this happen in our lifetime. The prophetic birth, prophetic birth of Israel on May 14, 1948, together with the reunification of Jerusalem under Jewish control in June of 1967 is what Bible scholars call the super sign the definitive sign that we're truly in what the Bible calls the last days before the return of Christ. And throughout the Old Testament, Israel is symbolized as a fig tree. And Jesus told us in the parable from the fig tree in Matthew 24, in verses 32 and 33, Jesus said, now learn the parable, parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So you too, when you shall see all these things, recognize that he's near right at the door. And we're seeing the signs that precede Christ's return. We're experiencing the birth pangs that will come before Christ comes. We're being shaken as prophecy warns. Listen, we're being shaken as prophecy warns the church because Jesus wants to wake us up. Hebrew writer says, all that can be shaken will be shaken so that only that which is, which is in God and that is true can stand. We don't know the day or the hour, but Jesus said we can know the season. And we should be living as though Jesus is right at the door, ready to come back. Matthew 24, 42, therefore be on alert, for you know not which day that your Lord is coming. Matthew 24, 43, be on the alert. Verse 24, for this season you all also must be ready for the Son of Man's coming in an hour when you do not think he will. I'm asking you, are, ready, are you ready to see Jesus face to face? Do you ready? Have you given your life to Jesus? Would you go to heaven if he were to come back, if he were to call your name and you were to stand before him? You can be certain. You can be certain, but maybe you're already a believer. 
Maybe you've given your life to Jesus, but in your heart you know you're not walking faithfully with God. You're drifting. You're far away tonight. God is calling you, calling you back to his arms, asking you to call out and, and repent and turn around and run back into his arms of forgiveness, asking you to make the day a fresh start, a day to walk in righteousness with a willing spirit. And the scripture tells us if we confess our sins, that he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But to start, we need to wake up. The Hebrew prophet Joel wrote, wake up and weep, you drunkards. Why? For the day of the Lord's coming, surely it is near. The Lord said in the book of Revelation, as I read earlier to the church at Sardis, to wake up. To wake up, he says in that passage. Know that I might come anytime. This is not a good time to be living in, to be goofing around. It's not a good time to, to do something you shouldn't be or watch something or listen to something or read something or spend time with someone or something that for which you would be ashamed when Jesus comes back. The Apostle John put it this way. Now little children abide in him so that when he appears, listen, when he appears we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming, 1 John 2, 28. Let's be clear, the Bible tells us that these shakings are going to continue and get worse like birth pains, increasing in frequency and intensity, contraction and release, contraction and release. And God the Father is trying to wake us up before it's too late. Listen to me, I'm not saying he's coming this year or next year or the year, one day is like a thousand years to the Lord. But I'm telling you, every generation, there's signs that I'm telling you, you're foolish just to think, well, it could be. But I'm going to give you another warning. Let's listen carefully. The rapture is not an escape clause. We already, right now, people that are Christians are going through horrors. They are being put to death with pain. You hear what I'm telling you? We live in a wicked world. We live in a sinful world, and the trouble in America has not been our politicians. It's been the sins of the heart of the people that our politicians reflect in their governing. They're not all evil. They just are just like everyone else that we know. It's not, the, it's not gonna be our answer. And I'm not preaching against that politician or for this one. Don't misunderstand, don't hear a thing. I'm just saying as a church, if we want to see America great, we need Jesus to come and fill the parts of people. We need the church to rise up, be the church and be witnesses. And that the message of the cross is carried because the cross demands sacrifice, the death of man the, to come and, and, and bow before him and say, I am unholy and he is holy. I am not good. He is good. We need to rekindle our first love with him, to embrace him, to eat daily of the bread of life, to drink daily of the spirit and the living waters, to follow him no matter what the journey, to serve him no matter how high the cost, to discover his, his mercies every morning new and fresh, to discover that when the world's being shaken, that we don't have to be shaken, not in your heart, not in your soul, because we have a hope in Jesus. And I am not afraid that that song this morning said it. See, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but power and of love and of a sound mind. And the Bible says that there is no fear in the perfect love of God. Perfect love casts out fear. And folks, as Americans, we don't have to be afraid no matter who the president is or who our congressmen are. And let me tell you, you don't get hope because of that. I'm telling you, you don't. The hope is in Jesus. I've lived long enough to, to not put a lot of stock in anything politicians tell me. And get mad if you want to. We'll see what happens. But here's the thing. As Christians, we have to be different. We have to be the people of God, the people of grace, the people of love, the people of kindness, the people of, of faithfulness, the people of peace, the people of joy, the people of, of gentleness, the people of of, of graciousness and kindness and we need to walk in the truth with the love of God and forgiveness for all mankind those that are sinners as Jesus treated the woman at the well he he loved and he forgave her we need to love people and hate sin Hebrews 12 28 says when we give our lives to Christ the scripture says we'll receive a kingdom that can't be shaken we are of the kingdom of heaven not of this earth 
and our loyalties is to Christ and his kingdom and our efforts and our work and our investment and our time and our energy has to be the invisible kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God and not of the kingdoms of this earth. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 16, 8, I have set the Lord continually before me because he's at my right hand. I will not be shaken. And cast your burden upon the Lord. He'll sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. Psalm 55, 22. Where are you tonight? Are you ready to meet Jesus face to face? Or are you shaken? We cannot be a fearful people. We must go forward into battle. Onward, Christian soldiers, America, what the answer for America is, is Jesus and Christians to rise up, be sold out to Jesus, and take this good news to every person, every, every individual, the babies through the 99-year-olds that are out there, every race, every socioeconomic condition, every person, whether they're handicapped or not, I don't care who it is, the answer for everyone is Jesus. And we need to get excited about Jesus. We need to be passionate about Jesus. We need to be feisty about Jesus. We need to fight for Jesus. We need to fight for the message of Jesus and the cross of Jesus Christ. It is what saves lives. And when, will we rise up and be the church? And will you care enough to win souls? Will you pray with me? Father, in Jesus' name, we ask you to forgive our sins and help us rise up and be the church first. We're Christians first, God. We love America. And we're thankful for our veterans. We're thankful, God, for our leaders. And the Bible says to respect them. And many times we haven't, and that's a sin. And I pray, God, you would help us pray for our leaders, all of them, and that, Lord, we would be gracious to them, God, and we'd be kind in, in, in everything we say, God, and we would fight the good fight of faith within our country knowing that it's the gospel that makes a difference in the lives of humanity. And it's the only answer for all of us, Jesus. And may we be centered and unified and focused as Americans on Jesus Christ, as Christians in America, that it's about Jesus Christ. Christ the Lord. Hallelujah. God, I know that the greatest revivals come out of adversity. They come when trouble happens in the midst of war. I remember 9-11, the church on a Tuesday night being jam-packed. Faces I've never seen. A few weeks later, they were gone. I pray, Jesus, that we would see the in urgency every day as we look not, not just to the trouble of evil people. Sh well, are sinful people, let me put it that way, sinful people, killing other people, uselessly murdering them because they, they're, they, the office they hold, they're a, a, a politician or a policeman or, or, or any other reason, just merciless. God, I, I pray, Lord, that we would see that sin is the cancer in our society and that we would hold up the truth, the word of truth and righteousness and fight for your word and your grace in the lives of all people. May we really be army, an army going forth with the love of Jesus Christ and your truth, God. May we be bold, as bold as we are to argue about the Cyclones and the Hawkeyes or any other team. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know why there's hope for America? Because both the Cyclones and the Hawkeyes miraculously won Saturday. And they did it without God. And we got God on our, that was a joke totally. We got God on our side. And there's hope for us because of Jesus. Some of you are thinking there's hope for other reasons, there's not. And you can argue with me all you want, but I'm gonna tell you, when sin keeps permeating, our society keeps going down, we are going in a toilet, toilet bowl in a hurry because the S-I-N, S-I-N, everywhere, all around S-I-N, and Jesus Christ is the only answer to change a heart, to forgive a soul. And we have that good word, that gospel, the love of Jesus, the grace, to take it. Amen? If you've misunderstood me, talk to me, not about me, because I haven't meant to make any statement that's political in nature. I've been meaning to make a statement that the answer for America is Jesus now and forever. Amen? Amen. Amen. Will you stand with me? Will you stand with me? We're going to pray, and I'm going to dismiss you, and I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to think about this. Uh, I, I want you, you know, Pastor Jeff emphasized the importance of coming together as a church, and you've done that. But I want you to know that as important as it is to come Sunday morning, Sunday night, or when you can, 
as often as possible because you love you love the church. The church isn't the or institution or the preacher, it's the people. Love the people of God, to worship with the people, to pray with the people, to care about the people, to encourage and exhort one another and prefer one another in love. The church is a beautiful thing. Jesus died for the church. He died as you and me. He loves us. But I want you to know that while that's important as a fellowship, what's just as important is your personal time with God as you walk it out. No one can do it for you. No one can do it for you. And I, I'm challenging you to ask yourself, have you ever won anybody to Jesus? And when's the last time you witnessed? How hard are you trying? How much energy are you putting? Do you weep tears over the lost? Do you really care? Because until we win souls, our culture will not change. Those who are racist, it's because they don't have the light of Jesus in their heart full and bright. Those that are greedy, those that do cheat for gain, same thing because they don't have Jesus fully lit in their heart. Those that are vile in their speech, it's because they don't have Jesus fully in their heart and alive in God. Do you understand that? Those that lie, same thing. Those that are mean-spirited, same thing. It's Jesus the answer. Father, bless this your church. It's your people. I trust they truly know you and they're not just religious. What a great message Pastor Jeff brought about true faith. You can feel good, you can have emotion, you can, you can believe the right thing. Doctrine doesn't save us, Jesus saves us. I pray, oh God, that you would cause us to become your people so much that we live, breathe, and have our being in you, as Paul said. We are living and, and breathing and having our very being in you, God. You're our heartbeat, you're the air we breathe. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, help us, and help us be with just the intensity of the giving our lives as Billy Graham, not to become a paid evangelist to, to preach in stadiums, but God, that the passion to bring this cross, it's the, may be foolishness to the world, but to those that are saved, the power of God and the salvation to bring the message of the cross to the world and quit just bringing the, the, a piece of it, but we bring it all, we confront people with Jesus Christ and the cross. I pray, help us, God, to be bold and bring in the people of God, people that have come to you, God, I want to win people. I want everyone to want to win somebody, God. I don't, I, don't, I don't want to go on just being the bless me club that we've been saved for 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. I want to see new people come to you in Jesus' name. Amen. How many say amen to that? That's going to change America. Listen to me. In our church, there's a lot of people that know nothing about the Bible. Are you hearing me? During those weeks of friends and family, we had several families get saved. Some have never been in church their whole life in their 40s. Never. You understand that? So when you walk in this door, you're maybe looking, don't just assume they're like you. They're not like you. They don't know what you know. Don't judge other people. They need to learn and they need to grow. Don't assume that they're where you are even understand what you understand. You come in here and you love everybody and you build relationships and out of relationships and kindness become salt and become iron sharpening iron. Let's be the church and help each other be strong, but let's go out without a song, but with determination in our heart to go win somebody. Amen? Amen. Say amen real loud if you led someone to Jesus. Wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. You didn't let me finish it. You're like my wife. You just interrupt and answer what you think I'm asking. Listen to me. Listen to me careful. Say amen really loud if this past week you led someone to Jesus. Good job. I heard two, I think. Let's get to where if I ask that question on a Sunday, there's about 50 to 100 people because that's our passion and that's one soul at a time will change America. Amway thought they had it, but Jesus had it. He sent 12 out and he revolutionized the whole world. Can I get 12 that'll actually start doing this or am I just up here being a professional preacher? You go, well, we got a good pastor. That weaver boy, he really told the truth. He's a, you know, I don't want that. I could care less. I hate to preach. You know what? I don't like to preach. How I many you knew that? Ask my pastors. I don't like to preach. I like to pastor. Okay, that's why I'm not very good at it. You got a good one this morning, though. Let's go. Amen, brother. Win somebody.